Welcome to Just Plain Wrong, the podcast where three Mennonite librarians discuss depictions of Amish and Mennonites in popular culture. So back when we first started planning this podcast, we knew that there was one book that we all really wanted to read, The Thrill of the Chaste, the allure of Amish romance novels by Valerie Weaver Zerker. And in fact, back in our intro episode, we mostly jokingly stated that we wanted to have Valerie on our podcast as a guest. Well, thanks to a well-connected listener, shout out to Marshall King, we were able to get in touch with Valerie and she graciously offered to join us. So this week, we're really excited to have Valerie as our first guest, and I'm going to give a little introduction. So in addition to being the author of Thrill of the Chase, Valerie is a writer and editor at Broadleaf Books. Her writing can be found in a whole host of publications, including Wall Street Journal, Christian Century, Salon, Mennonite Quarterly Review, and so much more. Valerie is also an alum of Eastern Mennonite University, which provides a nice balance for our Goshen College and Bluffton University representation. Valerie, we are so glad you're willing to join us for this conversation. Is there anything you wanted to add to that very brief intro? Thank you so much. No, that captures, I mean, my working life. Sure, there's lots of other details I could give you, but um, no, I appreciate the introduction and the chance to be with you all. Really looking forward to the conversation. All right. Well, we're going to start by having you (laughs) do our Amish title generator. Basically, it's an Amish blanks, blank, blank, blank. Oh, my word. So fun. Okay. So you want me to start? Yes. Uh, I'm, oh, you've got a lot of options for the favorite Amish treat. Okay. An Amish Long John's. Oh, wait. So be orphan. Oh, 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 right, right, right. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. Let me just, so I'll just say the, the first part and you mm-hmm. tell. Okay. Um, the second one, number nine. An Amish orphan's reluctant. Oh, and I can get the next one. Romance. <laughs> In space. <laughs> So wait, say it all together. An Amish orphan's reluctant romance in space. Oh, so fun. (laughs) I would 100% read that. In fact, we did just start reading Amish vampires in space. Oh, no kidding. An episode. I don't know. That book's long, so it might be a little bit before we (laughs) actually get around to talking about that one, but we did start it. Anyway, listeners, we will put that on our Instagram and other social media. Uh, thank you for doing that. <laughs> You're welcome. We also have a tradition of starting and ending episodes with um, talking about our most Mennonite thing we did this week, uh, which often revolves around baking or just random frugal things that we've done. So I didn't know if you had a, a most Mennonite thing that you'd want to share with us. Yeah, so um, this is a very like Swiss, German, Pennsylvania Mennonite thing. Um, And I'm sure some of these, some of the strands cross a claw, you know, there are global Mennonite and Russian Mennonites and lots of other kinds of Mennonites who would share some of these things. But it involved taking a meal to someone that my particular version is I have a good friend whose father is ill and she needed a ride from the airport to Belleville, Pennsylvania, which is a big Amish and Mennonite area. And so I picked her up at the airport. We wore masks probably the first time I've had somebody in my car that I'm not living with, but it felt like a a time to stretch COVID regulations. So I drove her to Belleville and took her to her parents' house to be with her parents. And I just took them a meal because her father's ill, right? And um, wanted to share Mm -hmm. that with them. Well, the Mennonite part really comes through in the like recipes I use. So I used a Simply in Season recipe. Mm -hmm. If if, uh, listeners aren't familiar with Simply in Season, it's a wonderful cookbook that you ought to buy that um, has a lot of great seasonal recipes. So I used the veggie burrito bake recipe in the Simply Season cookbook, a really good recipe. And then I used another Mennonite cookbook for my dessert, Hope's Table, which is a recent Uh, Mennonite cookbook from Harold Press. So it was a very, yeah, kind of probably Mennonite thing to do. My mom's family has origins in Belleville. So maybe this can be the most Mennonite thing I've done. It's just randomly tell uh, someone I just met (laughs) where my ancestors are from. because (laughs) That's what we do. Abby or Tilly, did you have a Mennonite thing that you wanted to share? I, or I wanted to just comment on Valerie's story was that I also noticed that you helped edit or revise the 30th anniversary or were you somehow involved with the more with less yeah cookbook 
I was, yeah, I was working at Herald Press when um, we decided to come up with a revised edition, which was like terrifying and exciting all at the same time. Hmm. Definitely felt That's... like dealing with holy writ, right? So, but that yeah. is awesome. Yeah. That is awesome. Is that Harold Press's like top seller? It is at the top, Martyr's Mirror, which is for listeners who are familiar with a massive martyrology, I think would be the top seller, but more with less would be right, right up there. Interesting. Like the the top two gifts to give recent graduates, right? Like (laughs) a book of martyrs and a book of recipes. There you go. I guess that does make me think of one Monday night thing. I, a Saturday morning tradition I have two young children and I like to make a double recipe of the whole wheat buttermilk pancakes on page 73 in the More With Less cookbook. <laughs> so there's a couple, there's only two recipes that I know like the page number memorized as well, but that's, that's one of them. So maybe I'll make that as my most Mennonite thing I did this week. All right. Well, with the end of our random Mennonite things conversation, I think Tilly is going to launch into some questions about your actual research uh, on Thrill of the Chaste. Yes. The first thing I have to ask, or we have to ask, is who came up with the title? What moment of genius happened (laughs) surrounding the title? Everyone I've ever mentioned the title to or the book to has thought that it's brilliant and has laughed. Well, thank you. Yeah, that was me that came up with it. And I will say I felt very clever until I discovered there is another book by that title. So titles can't be copyrighted. So I was relieved we could go ahead and use the title. It, there, there is another book by that title that's actually about chastity. It's kind of a Christian book about kind of sexual purity and chastity. So I, I, it kind of popped my little bubble there once I discovered I wasn't the first person to come up with it but I don't remember exactly when in the process I came up with the title but it was one of those titles that I did I had the feeling like when I came up with the idea that it would work and then it was then it just actually throughout the writing process though became a much more integral part of the book than I expected it to I think I thought oh this is a clever title you know scholarly books are often seen as kind of dry and I kind of liked the idea of a you know witty kind of poppy title but as it turns out as I did my research I discovered the kind of centrality of chastity both in the genre and then I play with it I kind of talk about chastity operating on three levels in the genre and so it became I ended up it I ended up using it much more than I expected to when I originally came up with it. When it comes to your research, how did you go about connecting to the readers of Amish romance mm. and and the Amish people themselves? Yeah. It was a process. If if people have read my book, they know that that the most interesting questions to me had to do with the readership. I had to decide pretty early on kind of what theory I was going to use, like what analytical lens I was going to use to look at the genre and you know, how, whatever your central question is determines the kind of thing you end up writing, right? So pretty early on, I figured out that I want, one of my central questions was, is like, these books are being produced by and consumed by and large evangelical women, right? White evangelical women. And so I really wanted to learn why, like, why are they so popular? What's driving demand? What's driving production? Like, what is going on in this kind of burgeoning um, market? And so I did focus, I, I do have a chapter on Amish readers of Amish fiction, and kind of how the Amish are metabolizing this phenomenon that's grown up around them. But I will say that my interest and what I thought would be most illuminating would be talking with readers. Like they're the ones that are, in addition to the authors and the publishers, like that's the apparatus that I kind of wanted to figure out more than like the questions related to how are the Amish responding? Are the books accurate at all? Where do they go wrong? It was much more about the like apparatus that created the genre. So, so in terms of how I connected with readers, I live in some overlapping circles with Amish fiction readers. So there were some readers I could find just by like people I knew, you know, somebody would say, well, my sister-in-law loves Amish romance novels. You could talk to her and they they kind of, the networks 
kind of, yeah, they, there were some that I had kind of direct access to. Someone introduced me to a woman who proved to be super helpful in my research. She was part of a book group in, in Illinois, and they read a lot of Christian fiction. Amish fiction is just one of the subgenres they read within Christian fiction. And she warmly invited me to come and visit their book group. And so I interviewed women there. And it just, it kind of, you know, people would connect me with other readers. Oh, this person is a real Amish fiction fan. I bet they'd be willing to talk to you. So it was kind of that, that kind of network um, that, that was very helpful reading the book, you mention a good number of Amish romance, starting from the earliest titles up until the time the book was published. Do you have an estimate of how many Amish romance novels you read? Yeah, so before we had this conversation, I kind of Re- skimmed my book because I, I really, I did write it long ago that I uh, had to remember what I said about it. <laughs> so um, I was refreshing my memory and saw that I do apparently mention it in the book. I read about 40, which looking back actually doesn't sound like that much. And for you all in your podcast, you're going to get there like in no time. I mean, aren't you reading like one a week? Am I right? It's kind of the average. Yeah. yeah. So like you'll be there very quickly. Going off of the title generator, we uh, the first the worst title I think I've ever seen is probably one that Abby found when she was the cataloger at the Mennonite Historical Library, which is Amish Christmas Baby Gone. Oh, it's bad. It's really <laughs> bad. It makes no grammatical sense. It's just got a bunch of keywords lapped into it. Um, it's a self-published one, and it, but increasingly it seems like these are the kind of titles that we're getting. Uh, or maybe I think that we're getting more of them because I see them every day. Did you find any titles that just jumped out at you as just absolutely ridiculous? You know, it's funny that you mention a Christmas title. I, I'm not. I'm not coming. I, I'm not coming up with any like off the top of my head. But when I when I looked at that question, I. I thought of the Christmas titles actually, because I, I remember, I mean, again, I kind of finished my, my book was published in 2013. So Mm -hmm. I really have not continued with research beyond 2012, I guess, um, when it would have gone to press at that time. And it sounds like it's still continuing. There's a real Christmas thing going on and, and working in publishing. I understand that we, you know, as publishers, we are all about selling books, right? And people buy books at Christmas time. They buy gifts, they buy books for themselves to read over Christmas break, the kind of like Amish Christmas bride. There's just so many of those. And of course the irony, as you all know, is that the, for the Amish Christmas is a rather muted holiday celebration compared to the rest of how most of us celebrate. So it's just a kind of an internal irony of the genre. My my favorite thing with the titles currently is just how many have the same title at this point. Like mm. we did an unlikely Amish match recently and I realized when we were introducing it that I needed to differentiate it from two other titles. So anyways, I'll kind of take us into the next section so you kind of mentioned obviously you wrote this book um and probably were doing a lot of the research almost 10 years ago so a lot of things might have shifted or changed so I was just wondering if there was things that you kind of looking back wish maybe you would have included or covered more thoroughly yeah that's a great question it is startling to me what a different book I think I would write today, to be honest. And it does have everything to do with the 2016 election. And I would have said before 2016, I was aware, I think I would have prided myself in being aware of the machinations of white supremacy and the way that the evangelical, white evangelical church is tied into racism. I think it was an eye opener for me as a white person that would have, were I writing the book after 2016, I think I would have looked deeper at the connections between race and the growth of Amish fiction. So I deal with the topic in the book, but in a pretty cursory way my my book again is looking at why is Amish fiction so popular? That's the central question. It's not really what's right about these books. What do they get wrong? It's not really how Amish people respond to them. Responding to them, it's really why 
are they popular and why are they popular now? And who are they popular with? What work are they doing in those readers' lives? Like how is how are these books functioning to help them process contemporary life? And so in the book, I identify these twin kind of engines of Amish fiction, but hypermodernity being one of them and hypersexualization being the other. I think today I would add a third you know, leg to that stool. And I, it would be something related to whiteness. And, I, and I, I just think I was not cognizant enough of how, I, I, again, I wrote about it in the book and, it's, and you can't miss the fact that these are books about white people produced by white people mostly read by white people. That's the readership's a little more diverse in terms of what I found, but in terms of production and the characters, there's an occasional person of color, but I just think I underestimated the reality of, of, of whiteness. I'm not sure how I would have gotten my head around readers' responses around race. I don't know. I would have had, I, there would have been a lot for me to figure out, but I think I would have dealt with that in a much more intentional and serious way, that there, there is a nostalgia politics that is driving a lot of white evangelicalism these days, and these readers are not exempt from it, and nostalgia is at the root of this genre, so I think the nostalgia at the root of the genre and the nostalgia at the root of Make America Great Again kind of politics, I think they're connected, and I'm not sure how, but I think I would have tried to figure that out if I were writing it today. That's something that we have, we've discussed this amongst ourselves in terms of figuring out how to make sure that analysis and awareness is in our own ways that we delve into these books. You know, we're very aware of the fact that we're three white Mennonite women talking about this genre. So we just try to keep that. And that's something we want to continue to kind of delve into you frame the question really well. And I think we, I think I would really agree with much of that framing and also have a lot of interest and curiosity about the answers. And I know like, as we've tried to figure out how to have these conversations as part of the podcast, one thing that's really hard is that the books are so, like the, the absence of people of color makes it hard to ever, like it's hard to talk about something that's not there um, when we're like analyzing a book and sort of laughing at its plot points. So I, I appreciate you bringing that into this conversation to give us sort of a, a jumping off point to sort of engage with those questions. Yeah. yeah, you know, I was looking back through the section where I do deal with race and um, I say something very similar to what you just said, Erin, just in terms of like the difficulty of analyzing an absence. Mm -hmm. But I think... I wouldn't let myself off the hook so easily. And I sense that you're not letting yourselves off the hook either, just in the fact that it, it, it's awfully hard to figure out how to talk about something that's not there, not visible at the same time. It's, I think it, it's clearly driving at least one of the drivers. There's so much nostalgia connected with these books. And I, ha I had not thought through the kind of political and racialized elements of white nostalgia and you know the era of globalization the kind of white anxiety around immigration the kind of white evangelical churches inability to deal with histories of enslavement and i'm not sure either how i would have gotten my head around it or what how i would have researched it but i think i would have had to deal i, I wish i would have dealt with it i wish i would have been more more cognizant of it and i I think there's room there for somebody to do some work, some scholarly kind of work and podcasting work um, <laughs> and figuring out um, how to make those connections. Yeah. You're probably inspiring yeah. someone's like yeah. dissertation topic right now. And, you know, of course, as an, like as an Anabaptist myself, one of the baffling things about this whole genre for me is, you know, I've tended to think about, I mean, I've known for a long time the white evolution evangelical church is wedded to kind of civil religion, to patriotism, it's this kind of weird thing as I was writing, trying to figure out how do these folks who, you know, have no trouble with pledging allegiance to the flag and supporting the military and like, how do they make sense of this romanticization or like at least fictional escape to these people that if they really know what's going on, like, you know, the Amish are not about support for the nation state, at least 
by and large, theologically, right? We know the reality on the ground is some, sometimes different. But I think there is a way in which the Amish function in these imaginative spaces that the novels create as a little nation state. And I don't know, I, don't, I haven't thought through this enough to really make this claim probably, but they're, they're functioning as these little dominions in some way, you know? So it's these self-contained communities by and large. I mean, there's people coming in and out, but it, it, there's a, th this might be too far-fetched, but I just wonder if there's some kind of, if, if I'm a white reader who's anxious about the changing demographics around me, I just wonder how much of the appeal of an escape to a white, a white landscape populated by white characters in, you know, the white, the people in charge are white men, whether there's a yeah kind of something going on there. Anyway, it's 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 also you know, it's also easy as a, as an observer to make claims without evidence. So you know, uh, there would have to be ways to get our heads around this that I'm sure, some scholar can figure out how to do, but I think they're really interesting questions and really important ones. Interesting to think about that from an angle. I'm thinking of people who are deeply patriotic to the idea of America, but who have no faith in the American system of governance, who might actually see value in the Anabaptist tradition of rejecting government services and things. Like you think about people you know, getting together with the militias and camping out in the middle of nowhere. And, right. you know, I, it kind of worries me that these are the kind of people who could look at Amish and Mennonites and say, hey, they're cloistered and rural and right. they don't take handouts from the government and neither right. should I. And right. only they come out probably on a significantly more violent yeah, but that is interesting. I mean, the Amish communities tend to be so self-sufficient in terms of caring for each other and little use of government services. And there is a kind of streak of libertarianism that you could say would be not at odds with some of those, yeah, kind of strands of American life. Interesting. Well, you know, obviously you did your research almost 10 years ago. Do you do, do you feel like some of the, maybe the reasons people are drawn to Amish romance may have changed aside from, you know, the conversation we just had about the role of, of racism in all of this? You know, it's hard to say because I haven't continued to do research, but my sense is if my theories were correct in the book, that is that these two forces, what, what one French theorist calls hypermodernity, um, which is this kind of sensation of living in a, um, you know, the, the way that readers described it to me was like, I feel like life is speeding up, technology is changing, I can't keep up. But there's, there's a theoretical framework behind that, you know, theorists call it hypermodernity. Um, if indeed hypermodernity is at play and, um, as a piece of that, what scholars and journalists have called hypersexualization of popular culture. Um, if these two forces are indeed at work in making readers feel like the pages of an Amish novel are a way to both escape those forces and kind of metabolize them, then I do think the reasons probably haven't changed. They've maybe just deepened. And in some ways, I think that it makes, I mean, I imagine from your perspective, this genre that is not going away anytime soon, right? Like these books just keep coming out. Am I right? Yeah. <laughs> you three are nodding. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think as long as the forces of hypermodernity and hypersexualization are at work, again, if my theory is have any merit, then it would make sense to me that people are still flocking to the, to the genre. What do you have thoughts on that? Are the reasons people are going to the to the books changing from what they used to be? Yeah, I'm not sure I have too much to add in terms of readership in general, because yeah, we haven't really haven't had a chance to talk to other readers. My favorites of the books, the ones that I've enjoyed the most, I feel like kind of echo some of my favorite books from when I was little, which have their own complexity in terms of race and everything. But I love Laura Ingalls Wilder books when I was younger. And there's that. And I feel like, especially with the hyper hyper modernization, that rings true in the sense of there's a, a slowing of the pace. There's a light, life is not rushing by in these books. Yep. And that yep. definitely, 
I, so I think personally, I can see like the ones that I've really enjoyed have that. In, in well, and I, my guess, and I don't have any evidence to back this up, but my guess is that Amish fiction sales during the pandemic have gone gangbusters. Is that a word? Like, I think, I think we, we know that kind of comfort reads kind of genre fiction tends to do well in times of social upheaval, right? Reading becomes this escapist. I mean, reading's always escapist in some way, right? Or reading fiction is in some way, but, and, and just as you know, you all know during the pandemic that people are at home, of course, the world feels like a less safe place than it did before. And people are like baking sourdough bread and eating meals together. And like, there are these kind of domestic craft skills, things that we're doing mm-hmm. that I just have a feeling that the appeal of the books might even be increasing during an era, a COVID era. I don't know, but. I bet you're right. No, that would make total sense. In fact, yeah. I feel so certain that you're right. Well, I want to move us along, but I did want to just maybe talk a little bit about um, one of the things you predicted in your book was an increase in non-romance Amish themed mm-hmm. novels. And I was thinking this might be, and if there's things that have popped up that have surprised you, or maybe a chance for us to talk about some of these sub sub genres um, might be of interest. Yeah. Well, I would love to hear what you all are finding in that regard. Cause again, I feel like you are much more up on kind of what is happening in terms of the genre than I am. I don't remember exactly what I predicted, but I do, I think I kind of, that sounds familiar. The sense that, you know, for this, for this genre to continue, every author has to kind of stake out their territory, their niche. I mean, you, you have these, in, it, when I was doing my research, there were kind of three authors that whose books were just selling like crazy and it was getting harder and harder for new authors to get in. So it makes sense to me that there's like, that's not the only reason, I guess, but it seems to me that the splintering into like niche markets would help the sale of any one particular book to, to gain steam. So, so yeah, I'm curious to hear what you all are finding in terms of sub, sub or sub, sub, sub genres of, of Amish fiction. Oh, there are so many varieties. The ones that I think amuse me the most, and I know we're going to get around to reading some of these for this podcast, are the retellings. And so the fairy tale retellings didn't shock me. You know, there's someone who's Rebecca and she goes by Becca and she's the belle of the story. And Mm -hmm. there's an angry old widower who's the beast and she has to get married to him and take care of his house. And along the way, he becomes a decent human being again or something, you know, so Beauty and the Beast retelling. Also Jane Austen retellings. (laughs) Those are uh, fairly new. I think we're waiting, we've got, alternate Emma, alternate Pride and Prejudice. I think we're still waiting on alternate Persuasion and alternate Northanger Abbey, but they're coming. There's a series. The Mystery didn't surprise me. That one felt fairly natural. Thriller a little bit surprised me, but it probably shouldn't have because people have got in their heads now that in an apocalyptic scenario, the people who are going to live are the people who, who are not relying on the need the things for modern society so there are any number of sci-fi and thriller and apocalyptic scenarios that have Amish and older Mennonites being the people to lead yeah. lead the survivors back to some semblance of normalcy because they're the ones who remember how to farm and they're the ones who remember how to get around without cars when no one can get gasoline anymore. Erotica is a thing now that one did surprise me but I probably shouldn't the one thing I haven't seen or that I haven't seen much of is like young adult. Oh, you know what is, I can't believe someone hasn't written this. Maybe, maybe we should write this. A Amish retelling of the Hunger Games. Oh. That would be fascinating. Take the whole like apocalyptic chosen one YA thing and then put a like nice little Amish veneer on top I don't know how it would work but I would read it that sounds or maybe there's just two there's one one state that's like non-violent so they when they their representatives try and compete in the Hunger Games but like without killing the other children Mm, they just find a third way every time they're faced (laughs) with violence they just like try to duck out of it I mean that's kind of what Katniss and Peeta did maybe they they, maybe this was an anaphaptist book all along and we didn't even know it (laughs) slap a bonnet on it that's right (laughs) 
I will say oh. the whole post-apocalyptic um, genre, which I was not aware was, I was only aware of one title in that kind of category, but I will say it's a really good novel and I reviewed it for magazine and I'm actually working with the author now on a nonfiction project. But have you all read When the English Fall by David Williams? I would highly recommend that. It, it's a... Uh, um, I mean, I kind of deconstruct these categories in my book, so I probably shouldn't use them, but I, it's a like literary novel um, published by Algonquin. And it's a, it's a, I mean, it's kind of doing what you were saying, Tilly, in terms of like the Amish people, there's a, there's a solar storm and English people can't live their lives anymore. And they flock to, to Amish communities or who know how to survive. The author, David Williams is a really, he's just a really good novelist. And it's a, it's a really interesting kind of take on on the Amish. He doesn't get it all right, and in my review of his book, I took uh, you know took him on on a couple counts, but apparently not too much that he decided not to work for me. So we, I'm his editor now on a nonfiction book. Um, he's also really he's a great nonfiction writer book uh, writer as well. But climate change, he's writing a book now. His nonfiction book is about climate change the climate crisis kind of comes up in his Amish novel, When the English Fall, because it's kind of a near near future setting where the weather is extreme and is not necessarily related to the apocalypse that happens, as far as I remember, but it's definitely kind of shot through with climate change kinds of themes. I'd, I'd highly recommend it. We'll add it to the list. As we embark on this uh, project, uh, do you have any advice for us about, well, this project in general, but how we read and discuss uh, Amish fiction and, and depictions of Amish in media? You know, I don't know that I, I have any advice. I will say, I, again, the theoretical approach I took in my book required a particular kind of posture toward the genre. So cultural theory, which is part of the, what part of one of the theories I rely on, just it invites the researcher or the observer to try to figure out what's going on. And that, that requires a certain empathy, I think. And so trying to find, you know, what what is going on in this book that appeal, that clearly appeals to the readers who are buying it. Like these books are selling like crazy. Like I work for a publisher. We would be thrilled to have the sales numbers of most Amish novels. So to figure out like what would appeal to readers and why, I just think is such an interesting question. I think as a Mennonite, it's tempting for me to just be frustrated with all of them because they're, they get things wrong and they, you know, there's a domesticating kind of impulse at the root of them. And it's a bunch of people making money off the Amish, which is itself problematic. But I, I think, I think questions of like, why are readers drawn to these books? And why are they still drawn to these books? And 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 what is fueling the continued kind of love for them? I mean, these are questions you're asking anyway, so I'm not telling you anything you don't know. But yeah, I just think you're off on a very interesting journey of figuring out what's going on and talking about the books. And yeah, I I think it's a, I think it's a great great kind of project. I do appreciate what you said about empathy because I think that's just one of my goals is that obviously you know sometimes we're poking fun or pointing out the ridiculous but I would hope that people listening you know should someone who wrote one of the books we talked about or someone who read that book and loved it would come away feeling that we had no empathy for them or no, no, no understanding of the appeal or no empathy for them as a writer or anything. So that is something that I try to, I don't know if I always succeed, but it's always a good reminder, I think, to not, again, we, we are applying a critical and somewhat maybe humorous lens to this, mm-hmm. but I yeah. hope that an underlying sense of empathy also comes through when, when we discuss these things. Well, our last question is just, uh, so what are, what are you up to now? Uh, you're not working on Amish research anymore. So what are you researching? And if you have any projects or stuff you want to plug, feel, <laughs> feel free. So yeah, I don't have any particular projects to plug, but I will say Broadleaf Books, which is the publisher I work for. It's a really exciting, pretty new imprint publishing adult nonfiction in the religion and spirituality and social justice space. 
and broadleafbooks.com is where you all can find out more about it. Really honored and proud to be part of that publishing program. And it really, I loved writing this book and I would love an opportunity to write another book, but there, I do find a lot of joy in helping other people write the books that they feel called to write or inspired to write. And um, I love I love being part of that process for other writers too. So I love my job and feel feel honored to be working with Broadly. When I heard you were an acquisitions editor, I was like, oh, so when the three of us write our first Amish romance novel together, we can send it to you. But unfortunately, Broadly. No, and <laughs> unfortunately, we don't do any fiction, but I could probably point you to some agents. Literary <laughs> agents, I imagine, are still on the hunt for Amish fiction and um, three Mennonite librarians. I don't know. You've got... You, have a good insider um, insider track. They might have a lot of interest in you as authors. We joke about it a lot, but yeah. maybe someday we should start a Google Doc. <laughs> well, Valerie, thank you for joining us on Just Plain thank Wrong. Thank you so much for having me. It was a real treat. <laughs> We're glad you could come. That wraps up this week's episode of Just Plain Wrong. Thank you again to our guest, Valerie Weaver Zerker, author of Thrill of the Chase, for coming on the podcast and chatting about your research with us. Tune in next week to hear our thoughts on the Amish episodes of two sitcoms, Schitt's Creek and Third Rock from the Sun. If you'd like to watch along, you can find Schitt's Creek on Netflix. You're looking for season two, episode one. And Third Rock from the Sun is on Peacock, and you are looking for season six, episode 17. As always, we love to hear from you, so feel free to reach out on social media. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Plain Wrong Pod, or you can email us at plainwrongpod at gmail.com. And we also love it when you rate and review our podcast, as that helps us be seen by other people who might not know about us yet. So thanks again for listening, and we'll talk to you next week. <laughs>